So, hello everyone, and welcome to the show, and also, Happy New Year. We're, uh, we're in 2024 now. I'm Max, as you probably all know, and this is episode 3.5 of PQ Attic Analysis and the Colas Conjecture. Uh, why three and a half instead of four? Well, this episode is more of a side quest. It's not really in line with the rest of what we're going to do in this series, and there's a possibility it's a dead end. Still, because I'm a classical analyst at heart, this is probably my favorite among the uh, various amusing consequences my research has uh, generated so far. Um, okay, so I need, to, I need to have a confession to make. I think generating functions are just amazing. They're the bee's knees. Really, I cannot emphasize this enough. Uh, there's even a religion, i.e. a textbook, based around generating functions. It's called Generating Functionology. Again, really. Um, uh, f generating functions come in loads of different flavors, uh, the simplest of, simplest of which is the ordinary generating function, which is when we take a given sequence, a n, and consider the power series with a n as the, coef as the coefficients. For analysis, uh, generating functions are useful because their analytical properties, such as their radius of convergence and the location and intensity of their singularities, can be used to make conclusions about the analytical properties of their coefficients. For example, we have the famous Hardy-Littlewood-Tauberian theorem, which asserts that if the ANs are non-negative real numbers and uh, this limit, and in other words, this has a simple pole at C, uh, at, a, at a simple pole at x equals 1, and the, uh, where it's the proportionality constant is c, and, and here c is positive, then the average of the, sum, of the coefficients uh, is equal, in the limit, is equal to c. <clears throat> so a Tauberian result, prototypically, is where we take a property of the generating function and use it to compute asymptotics for the sequence of its coefficients. An abelian result, on the other hand, is the converse, where we use a result about the behavior of the coefficients to deduce uh, the, ex the existence of limits or of the associated generating function. So of particular importance are the techniques of complex and Fourier analysis, which allow us to directly compute a generating function's coefficients via integral formulas, so prototypically the Cauchy integral formula. Among these, it's worth mentioning that it's often the case we can transform one type of generating function into another. Such transformations can reveal important properties of the original sequences that might not have been apparent at first glance. In analytic number theory in particular, there is a powerful interplay between ordinary generating functions and extra and, and generating functions of the following this form, where it's instead of uh, x to the n, it's e to the negative nx. And this seemingly harmless change of variables from x to e to the negative x actually has a great deal of depth to it due to the following completely formal argument. Let's just uh, expand e to the negative x as a power series, and then just defying all of the rules of classical analysis, let's substitute uh, this power series in and interchange the uh, two sums. Doing so, we then get the following relationship. Uh, this, uh, sometimes this is called a generalized Dirichlet series, but here this is an exponential generating function, and this is at least formally the value of the Dirichlet generating function of the ANs evaluated at negative k. <coughs> uh, in general, this, uh, although this formal argument is almost never true, it is nevertheless incredibly fruitful because there are many instances where if you add in necessary correction terms, it does become true. And in particular, there's then a deep connection between the behavior of this function as x tends to zero and the analytic continuability of, uh, of, of zeta a. And in, in, in particular, if we can, uh, uh, if you can subtract off the diverse, since, uh, if, when x is zero, this, this becomes the sum of the ans, and so if the ans are not summable, this uh, is obviously going to diverge at zero. However, if you can subtract off the divergent part of it, 
then you can then uh, you can expand the remainder as a power series about zero. You can arrive at the corrected form of this uh, above of this identity. A personal favorite case of mine comes from when we consider the sequence n, where a n is one if n is a power of two and zero otherwise. Then we have the following exact formula. Uh, which you can compute this using a Mellon transform theory. And it's that this power series, well, this exponential power series, is one half minus uh, Euler Mascheroni gamma over ln of two minus the base two logarithm of x plus this thing and this thing. This function right here is bounded uh, as x goes to either infinity or zero. And because we have log base two of x, at negative 2k pi i over uh, all up in the exponent of the e, this function, if we call it f of x, it's it's a it's a fractal function. It has an incredible, uh, incredibly large amount of of uh, oscillations, and it satisfies the functional equation f of 2x is equal to f of x. It's also very very small due to the rapid decay of the gamma function uh, as the imaginary part of s goes to uh, goes to positive infinity or negative infinity. Indeed. The uh, supremum norm of this function, it's less than 1.1 times 10 to the negative sixth. Meanwhile, this function right here is an entire function. It's analytic for all z. And so this then is the corrected version of the formula that you would get by applying this argument right here. And um, again, as I said, this is derived using the Mellon transform. Uh, given a function f from on the positive reals to the complex numbers, its Mellon transform is the integral from 0 to infinity of x to the s minus 1, f of x dx, where s is a complex variable. The Mellon transform is a multiplicative analog of the uh, of the Fourier transform, and it's uh, by a change of variables equivalent to a uh, bilateral uh, a Laplace transform. So, uh, noting the identity that the integral from Z, the Mellon transform of e to the negative n x is the gamma of s over n to the s, we then have that the Mellon transform will transform these uh, exponential power series into Dirichlet series. <clears throat> Again, as a multiplicative re relative of the Fourier transform, the Mellon transform can be inverted by way of the following formula, where we take the integral along the line in the complex plane with a real part equal to c, where uh, c is some sufficiently large uh, positive real number. If the Mellon transform here, f of s of this thing, uh, decays sufficiently rapidly, as the if well, if it admits a meromorphic continuation to the whole complex plane. And if this continuation decays sufficiently rapidly, as the real part of S tends to negative infinity, you can evaluate this thing exactly, by, like a complete evaluation, by using Cauchy's integral formula. You integrate over, uh, over a rectangular sector, and then you have the left side of the sector go off to negative infinity, and then everything, and then residues give you the exact formula. <laughs> So, um, in, in general, uh, the, you, can, you can think of the, also another thing to note, when you evaluate this by using residues, the result will be an ex, a power series in X, or a generalized power series, rather than an exponential one. So, the act of inverting the Mellon transform is a, provides us a, a way of untangling this, compl this exponential power series into a honest-to-goodness power series. <clears throat> Moreover, as we said before, as x decreases to zero, this function tends to the sum of the series, so the uh, divergences of this function at zero, its poles, etc., correlate to the asymptotics of this sum if it diverges. <clears throat> Indeed, if we look back at this formula here, uh, we have these constants, this function, which is not defined at zero, but is bounded, this entire this entire function which vanishes at x equals zero, the divergent terms of this, the only thing that diverges is uh, negative log two of x. This uh, is going to diverge to positive infinity as x decreases to zero. And indeed, if we set s to be the powers of two, we can rewrite this function at, by summing. Here, the coefficients are the indicator function of s. So this is 1 if n is a power of 2 and 0 otherwise. And if we do the direct computation of the nth partial sum, 
This is the uh, equal to the number of positive of non-negative integers m such that two to the m is less than or equal to big N. This turns out to be the same thing as lambda two of big N, the number of one, the total number of digits in the binary expansion of big N, which is precisely log base two of n plus one. So the equality, so this is law is a log is a logarithm, and this is a logarithm, and so this is a case of the. Uh, of the Hardy Littlewood uh, Tauberian theorem type behavior, where the asymptotics of the generating function and the sum summatory function of the sequence of the sequence of coefficients of our generating function, those two things have the same asymptotics. So why are we talking about all this? Well, the star of the show so far has been chi q. So it seems obvious that maybe we can get something interesting if we consider and gener a generating function like this, where sum of n equals 1 to infinity of chi q of n e to the negative nx. Note that we don't need to consider n equals 0 because chi q of 0 is 0. However, we can do more than just analyze this. Uh, we can, and it's all thanks to the correspondence principle. And in particular, first we're going to establish a useful uh, uh, variant of this, of it. So this was not covered in the previous episode. So let q be an odd prime. Then an odd integer x is a periodic point of the shortened qx plus 1 map if and only if x is of the form chi q of b2 of n, and in particular x is positive if and only if mq of n is less than 1, and x is a negative if and only if, uh, uh, sorry, this should be a 1. This should be if and only if 1 is greater, greater than mq of n. Uh, no. That should be if and only, the x is positive if and only if mq of n is less than 1, and x is negative if and only if mq of n is greater than 1. This positivity, negativity thing follows from version 2 of the correspondence principle for periodic points. And we did this in the last video, uh, uh, technically the uh, video before that, but whatever. Um, now, so moreover, if chi q of b2 of n is a rational integer, the correspondence principle tells us that it must be a periodic point. In particular, if n is greater than or equal to 1, this is necessarily going to be an odd integer. This follows from writing out uh, this fraction in the simplest form. So what this tells us is that uh, as that every number of Every rational integer of this form is an odd integer, which is a periodic point of TQ. So all that remains is to show the converse, that if given an arbitrary odd integer x, which is a periodic point of TQ, x must be of the form chi q of b2 of n. Um, now, so even, regardless of whether we know this is true or not, the correspondence principle tells us that because x is a periodic point, x must be of the form chi q of z0 for some unique rational two-adic integer z0 with infinitely many two-adic digits. So by way of contradiction, let's suppose that z0 is not in the image of b2. Letting j be a sh uh, shortest string of positive length such uh, that it encodes the motions of this periodic point, chi q of z0, under uh, uh, tq, so in other words, this is saying is if we apply uh, the branches of TQ that are specified by J, then we'll map this periodic point to itself. Uh, as we saw in episode three, Z zero is not of the is not in the image of B two precisely when the rightmost entry of J is zero. Uh, this came, this thing, uh, I'll just scroll back just as to recall. What we saw is that, uh, as just here's an example, uh, this sequence right here, B2 of 1100, one, zero, zero, this is 1 plus 2 plus 0 plus 0, so this is 3 in base 2. So this is the same thing as that, whereas this number here, this is uh, 6. Again, it's this. However, so these two, if the, in other words, the string that we get by repeating these digits again and again and again is not the same thing that we get by repeating, by applying B2, and that's because there are these terminal zeros. On the other hand, uh, when n is 9, this, ha this string, it's fine, its rightmost digit is a 1, so when we apply B2 to it, we then get the composition, the infinitely many concatenated copies of this string. However, 
uh, for these, uh, th these are generated by 1100 and 0110. These we can't get by applying B2 because uh, B2 will only uh, give us nice things when our input final digit is not uh, one, is not uh, zero. So anyhow, what this then tells us, where was I? Uh, yes. We know that uh, since we assumed Z0 is not of the form B2 of N, the rightmost entry of bold J must be zero. Indeed, if the, uh, and, and, and if the rightmost digit of bold J was one, then by the correspondence principle, this would then tell us that uh, for choosing any n that re represented by bold j, we would then have that b2 of n is equal to z0. So the only way that this can't happen is if j bold j does not end in a 1. Since the rightmost entry of bold j is the first branch of tq that we apply when iterating chi q of z0, the fact that the rightmost entry of bold j is 0 that means that this number has to be even, because uh, if this was number was odd, but the right entry of j was zero, then uh, chi q of z zero would uh, the, the, this would be uh, we'd have a wrong value. Chi q of z zero would be the image of uh, this under the wrong string. So in particular, chi q of z zero would be a wrong value of uh, with a seed chi q of z0, and as we saw in uh, episode 3, all wrong values are non-integers, which is impossible here because chi q of z0 is x. It's the integer we are given with. <clears throat> so x has to be even, but we were given that x was odd. This is impossible. So it must be that x is of the form chi q of b2 of n for some n greater than or equal to 1. And so every odd peri integer periodic point of TQ is of the form chi Q of B2 of N for some N greater than or equal to 1. So in other words, to, uh, the corresponding principle to simplify it, to, all we, uh, to, to studying the values of chi Q of B2 of N is the same thing as studying the odd integer periodic points of TQ. So, in this regard, the above version of the correspondence principle which tells us that everything we could ever want to know about the periodic points of the shortened qx plus 1 map is contained within the behavior of the function n gets mapped to chi q of b2 of n. This would suggest that we should study this function directly. While this can be done, unfortunately, it is not practical. See, on the one hand, uh, uh, not on one hand, but just the main thing is, Almost every useful result involving chi q, both in the past and in the future, uh, utilizes chi q's functional equations somewhere. These recall that these are the uh, functional equations, and what's especially nice about these things is that uh, we can visualize them as, as when we uh, consider two n plus one or two n plus zero, we can express that in terms of some affine linear map applied to chi q of n. So chi q of 2n plus j is an af is the jth branch of tq applied to chi q of n. It's very nice, and that's what makes all of these things work. However, let's let a rho q denote chi q of b2. Then the corresponding functional equations for rho q are as follows. And this is very, very bad because here the... Uh, in the, the, there's no there, this uh, there's now a dependence on both n and j. So in chi q, the jth branch of the right hand side is of the form f j of chi q of n for some function f j of x, which depends only on j. In this in particular, when j is zero, f zero is x over two, and f one on the other hand is q x plus one over two. However, for rho q. The right-hand sides are of the, the form fj of rho q of n and n so for some function fj of x comma n. So, for example, here, fj of x comma n, and here this is f0, this would be 1 minus mq of n over 2 minus mq of n times x. So now it's dependent on both uh, n and j rather than just j. So... This means that the all of the nice things we can do with chi q that involve exploiting this functional equation, 
they're not going to be available to us for Roku. So this doesn't tell this doesn't mean that studying Roku is impossible or is not useful. It's just going to be much more difficult. Also, note that because MQ of n is going to there is going to be is a rational number which is varying between a I think sometimes it'll be much bigger than one, sometimes it'll be much less, much less than one, close to zero. Because of that, we'll have potentially have to deal with this thing getting stupidly huge if MN, if depending on whether MN makes these numbers small on the denominator. Fortunately, the correspondence principle is going to come to our rescue. And what we do is, as we did in the very beginning, uh, we just we relate uh, chi Q of B2 to chi Q and MQ. So what corollary uh, 7 right here, this result tells us, is that an x is an odd integer periodic point of tq if and only if we can write x equals chi q of n over 1 minus mq of n for some n greater than or equal to 1. So let's multiply by the denominator. That gets us 1 minus mq of n x minus chi q of n. So this thing is then equivalent to there being an n such that this is 0. So if we let, say, uh, a n of x be this quantity, we can then study the periodic points of tq by investigating the behavior of a n of x. As an example, if we picked x, an odd integer x, if uh, uh, x was a periodic point, then there would have to be some n for which a n of x was equal to 0. And if a n of x was never equal to 0, then x would not be a periodic point. So if we can, uh, this means that rather than wanting to study this uh, quantity's generating function, we want to study this quantity's generating function. And of particular importance to us will be Perron's formula, which uses Mellon inversion to express the summatory function of, 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 some, of whatever sequence we're looking at in terms of an inverse Mellon transform. So I'm going to here I'm going to assume some familiarity with the basic theory of Dirichlet series and the Mellon transform. The papers of Flagellet et al. Uh, on Mellon transforms, particularly the one about harmonic sums, are really nice and they cover all the necessary information. I'll uh, include the links to them in the description, and they're really a great source to learn. Still, it's worth going over some of the, of the most important details. So first, we need to recall the Cauchy principal value of an integral. Let C be a real number, and let f of s be a complex value a function, so that for every real number, t greater than or equal to 0, the integral of f of s ds along the line segment uh, connecting C minus i t to C plus i t, this integral needs to be exists and be finite. Note, we do not require the uh, supremum of the absolute value of this as t varies. We do not require this to be bounded. <coughs> Then we define the principal value of this integral as the symmetrically taken limit of, of this integral, provided that this limit exists, of course. And then we call this the principal value of this expression. With this, Perron's formula can be stated as follows. As follows. Let lambda be some complex-valued function on the non-negative, on the positive integers. And let C be a positive integer, be positive real number that lies in the half plane of absolute convergence of the Dirichlet series uh, zeta lambda. Then, for any integer any integer m greater than or equal to one, and any real number x greater than or equal to two, one over m factorial times the sum from k equals one to the floor of x minus one of lambda of k times one minus k over n to the power of m is equal to integral. Uh, when m equals uh, when m is greater than or equal to one, this integral is going to be nice. But when m is equal to zero, we have to take a principal value. And Perron's formula is a specific case of the more general situation of Mellon summation formula. And the basic idea here is that uh, when we have a Dirichlet series um, of uh, uh, lambda k over mu s k. If we want to, uh, uh, if we then take an inverse Mellon transform of this times the Mellon transform of some function f, this then in, it has the effect of entangling them and giving us a weighted sum of the following form. Flagellate et al. call these um, sums 
uh, harmonic songs. And you can use uh, melon transform methods to get very nice uh, asymptotics for, uh, for expressions of this form. So in order to make things a little bit easier to work with, I have some notations to introduce uh, here. Uh, chi, uh, zeta MQ is MQ's Dirichlet series. Zeta Chi Q is Chi Q's Dirichlet series. And in all this, S is a complex variable. And finally, for any integer X, we define FQ of SX as the Dirich, as the Dirichlet series of that uh, quantity we want to investigate. Uh, which is, um, adding everything together, we have the identity FQ of SX is equal to the Riemann zeta of function of S minus MQ's Dirichlet series of S times X minus Chi Q's Dirichlet series. Um, as we're about, we're about to see, all three of these functions uh, have the same have a, a, the same abscissa of absolute convergence. This is sig a number I call sigma q. It's the a base two logarithm of q plus one over two. So how can we use this to rewrite the co the weak Colatz conjecture as a, uh, a contour integral? Well, by Perron's formula, we have that the summatory function of this quantity here is going to be this thing over here. And is there an A? Where did yes, letting this we say yes, this works for any A between 0 and 1. If we take the nth minus 1th case of this thing and subtract it from the nth case, we then get the following formula. 1 minus mq of n times x minus chi q of n is equal to the principal value of this integral. And here n needs to be greater than or equal to 3. So what we've done is we've trans uh, by considering Dirichlet series. We've passed from the study of this quantity to the study of a contour integral. And so this then gives us the contour integral reformulation of the weak Colatz conjecture. Recall that the weak Colatz conjecture is the assertion that uh, 1, 2, and 4 are the only positive integer periodic points of the Colatz map. Or equivalently for T3, it is the conjecture that 1 and 2 are the only positive integer periodic points. So here, and also this result is actually going to be a little bit more general than that. So let Q be an odd prime and let C be any real number greater than sigma Q. Then 1, an integer X, which is not negative 1, 0, or 1, is a, a period, uh, this should be uh, an, an odd integer. An odd integer X is a periodic point of T3 if and only if this thing vanishes. An odd integer X not equal to negative 1 or 0 is a periodic point of T5 if and only if this thing vanishes. And if Q is greater than or equal to 7, an odd, an, odd integer, an odd integer is a periodic point of TQ if and only if this thing vanishes. Uh, the reason why we need uh, N greater than or equal to 3 is due to this fact right here, because then uh, this is chi Q of B2 of 1, and this is chi Q of B2 of 2. If Q is 3 or Q is 5, these are going to be 1, negative 1. And we have to keep them out because the values of N are too small for Perron's formula to apply. <laughs> so uh, this result is a wonderful example of the power and versatility of my uh, Newman formalism. By having reformulated the study of TQ's dynamics in terms of the value distribution of chi Q, a fundamentally analytic problem, we've basically embedded our, stu our Colat studies into classical analysis. And so everything that we can do with analysis, we can then use to try and attack this problem. Uh, moreover, because of the broad applicability of my formalism, we can use this method not only for the shortened QX plus one maps, but we can use it for Colatz type maps on number rings uh, over fields of characteristic zero. So all the multi-dimensional Hydra maps is in, in, in essence. All of these techniques work and so it'll be all be generalizable. And a particular interest would be like the, uh, the maps that we considered in episode two from acting on uh, uh, H, I believe was the guy's name. Uh, the ones that were on uh, the, the rings of cyclotomic integers on, on the complex plane, it would be interesting to see what the Dirichlet series analysis of that stuff is. 
So um, here, what we're going to do is we're going to analyze the Dirichlet series defined above. I'm going to derive their, merom their functional equations and then show that they have a meromorphic uh, continuations to functions with a half lattice of poles in the half plane, re the real part of S less than or equal to sigma Q. So to do this, the first thing we need to do is compute the summatory functions of chi Q and MQ. So these satisfy the following, that uh, the sum from n equals 0 to 2n minus 1 of chi q of n, it's this if q is equal to 3, and it's this if q is equal, greater than or equal to 5, and the summatory function of mq of n is this. So again, this is an, an important result, so it's going to use the functional equations. And the method itself is quite useful, it's, we'll be using it in varying guises. We're going to consider sq of n, it's our sum, and then we're going to split this sum in the end modulo 2. So we're going to sum over all the even inputs and all the odd inputs and then apply chi q's functional equations. This will then give us a recursion relation, relation which we can use to solve for things explicitly. So here, pulling everything out, we end up getting that s q of n is equal to 2 to the n minus 1 plus q plus 1 over 2 times s q of n minus 1. And then nesting this, recursively plugging it in, blah, 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 we get that sq of n is q plus 1 over 2 to the power of n times sq of 0 times this sum. Uh, sq of 0, we can compute that directly. It's just chi q of 0, which is 0. So we conclude that sq of n is this thing. We re-index here, and then that we get a geometric sum. And this is going to occur everywhere. But the reason why, uh, why Colatz is weird among the... Uh, 5x plus among the qx plus 1 maps is that the fundamental quantity for these maps appears to be q plus 1 over 4, which is 1 precisely when q is equal to 3, in which case this geometric series is degenerate and just grows linearly in big N. However, for all other values of q, this geometric series grows exponentially uh, in uh, with respect to N. <clears throat> so now we do use a, a similar method for mq of N, and we, here we just use MQ's functional equations, and we get this recursion relation, and splitting up into evens and odds, blah, 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 and we're done. <clears throat> oh, so now just as a reminder as to how Dirichlet series asymptotics work, uh, also we're, this is a Vinogradov notation, which means big O. So let C be an integer greater than or equal to 2, and let A of N be a non-negative real-valued function. And suppose that the sum from n equals 0 to c to the big N minus 1 of a of n is less than less than b to the, uh, b to the big N as big N goes to infinity, then we get the following estimate on the Dirichlet series, where here, in following standard analytic number theory conventions, s is equals, is the complex number s is equal to sigma plus i t. So this asymptotic then tells us that uh, the Dirichlet series converges absolutely for the real, uh, for the when re S has a real part greater than the base C logarithm of B. Uh, proof is just by Abel's summation formula, and then direct estimation, evaluate the sum, blah 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 blah, geometric series, and everything's nice. So now we establish the abscissa of absolute convergence for all of our Dirichlet series. So here we're just going to use our formulas. Uh, uh, in this case, this grows like two to the n. This grows like q plus one over two to the n. Which so in other words, what both of these tell us is that uh, these things both grow like q plus one over two to the n for all q. So then that tells us by that proposition that uh, since we have this estimate, uh, these functions will then uh, uh, have a, their Dirichlet series will have an abscissa of absolute convergence that's greater than sigma q, which is the base 2 logarithm of q plus 1 over 2. Uh, next, we establish an analytic continuation of fq uh, to a meromorphic function, and to do this, we're going once again, we're going to use the functional equations for mq and chi q. Uh, the way we do this is we're going to First, compute functional equations for the ordinary generating functions of mq and chi q, and then we're going to just uh, change from x, or in this case z, to e to the negative nx, and then we're going to use the Mellon transform. 
So, and the main thing is this identity right here. So let GMQ and GKIQ be MQ and KIQ's ordinary generating functions. And then we have that these satisfy the following. And here's Z, it's, uh, it's nominally, it's a, it's a complex variable in the open unit disk. And these functional equations, we get the following. These Indeed, these hold for all complex numbers Z with absolute value less than 1. And the proof, it's the standard thing. We take our, uh, our, take our function, we split ends up in evens and odds, and then we apply the functional equations. Boop. And then here we just solve for g m q of z squared in terms of g uh, m q of z. And likewise, for g chi q of z, split everything, use functional equations, thing, and then solve everything. And from this, we then get that what we want. So to simplify matters, let's now define an ordinary generating function for the, our full quantity here, and we're going to call that little fq of zx. And this is this thing, and we have this form, and then by using the functional equations for the g's, we get a functional equation for fq. And the argument is messy, so I'll just leave it here for a moment. We add and subtract things, do lots of fun manipulations, simplify everything, and then uh, divide, and then we solve for fq of zx, and we get this. So uh, now using fq of zx's functional equation in conjunction with the Mellon transform, we can obtain a functional equation for fq of s comma x. Uh, in particular, it's this, uh, where as we're standard notation, uh, this is just the binomial coefficient, which we extend for all complex numbers by uh, using the gamma function. So we're, our main thing is we're going to use this identity, which we apply to fq. So we're going to take this functional equation, replace z with e to the negative, uh, do I use y? I shouldn't, well, yes, e to the negative y. We replace z with e to the negative y, and then we apply the Mellon transform. So uh, the trick here is uh, when we do this, uh, e to the negative 2y, we're going to get three pieces. This thing, which comes from uh, this term right here, and then we have these two terms, which can be evaluated in closed form. One here, we break everything up, and we get this. Uh, here, we now make a change of variables, setting u to be 2y. This is uh, then going to be e to the, uh, fq. It's the Mellon transform of fq of zx, where we replaced z with e the negative variable. And here, when we do the same uh, change of variables, u equals uh, 2y, we are going to get this factor of e to the negative u over 2. To deal with this, we're going to expand e to the negative u over 2 as a power series and integrate term by term. We can do that because the of the of the fact the domain of integration is from zero to infinity. So as long as we consider the respective sets, we can use dominated convergence and it works out. And the main thing to note is that when we expand uh, e to the negative u over two as a power series, the u to the n is going to be absorbed by the Mellon uh, character here. And so now by multiplying and dividing by gamma of s plus n. This then here is a shifted copy of fq. And so this then, and here we recognize this as our binomial coefficient. So then putting everything together, this is what, what our first integral is equal to. Our second and third integrals can be evaluated directly. Here we just write at the geometric series. This is valid because this is uniformly convergent. And likewise, uniformly convergent here. Uh, so this is uh, one over. This is just one over n to the s, which is the the Riemann zeta function. And here, when we after writing everything out, expanding this is a geometric series. This is going to be one over two to the n plus one, which we can express as Riemann zeta minus the sum over the evens. So this is one minus two to the negative s times zeta of s. And so putting everything together, this equation becomes this equation, and now we just simplify things. Combine these two terms right here and manipulate, and then we have q plus 1 over 2, which we can then recognize as 2 to the sigma q. And so, uh, the, so just to simplify the notation a little bit, 
we're going to first define this function s q of little s x. It's this thing. Note that for any x and any po positive delta, s q of s x will converge uniformly to a holomorphic function on the closed half plane, real part of s greater than or equal to sigma q minus 1 plus delta. And in this notation, we get a nice compact version of our functional equation. And uh, do I need to talk about this? Uh, yeah, yeah, no, so I'll just talk about this right here. So, um, yes, so because of this part right here, we know that in our functional equation here, this is going to be holomorphic for a real part of s greater than sigma q minus 1. Since everything else on the right-hand side of this is uh, meromorphic, we then, this then tells us that fq of sx by this is going to be defined for the for real of part of s greater than sigma q minus 1. On the other hand, note that when s is equal to sigma q plus 2k pi i over ln 2, this number is going to make this denominator 0. So this tells us that fq of sx is going to have poles along, uh, th this is on the imaginary axis, also not, it's on the line sigma q, uh, S e, real part of s equals sigma q, it's going to have uh, these evenly spaced poles there, and uh, on, on that part, and so, we, and also we might get a simple pole at s equals 1 from the Riemann zeta function. So, we started with fq of s and showed that it was holomorphic for the real, for re, uh, re, real part of s greater than sigma q, and the functional equation here now gives us a meromorphic extension to sigma q minus 1. Uh, and we are now can, we can apply recursively to, to then show that we can shift, can keep, do, uh, keep using this to get an analytic continuation of fq all the way to the, uh, to the entire left half plane. And, but the first, before we need to do that, we need to prove a little technical result, which is that... Um, let uh, s z x be an integer other than negative 1, and let s0 be any complex number, so that fq of s0 plus n, comma x, is finite-valued for all n greater than or equal to 1. Then sq of sx is going to converge absolutely at s0. The proof is by the, our, the good old ratio test. Uh, this is the sequence defining s. And so by the ratio test, if this ratio is going to be less than 1 in absolute value, then sq will converge absolutely. Here, working through the details, we get that this is that. And now, so here, our, uh, s equals, choosing, choosing s equals at 0, note that our assumption that fq of s0 plus nx is finite valued makes cn a sequence of complex numbers. So, these are, so none of these are going to be undefined, because what we assume that this is defined Moreover, uh, for whenever s is bigger than sigma q, we can use the Dirichlet series to compute fq of sx. So as n goes to infinity, no matter what s0 is, we are eventually going to have this representation, and so it's uniformly continuous, and we can interchange uh, the limit and this sum. And so everything except the k equals 1 term dies because s0 plus n will make this go to uh, infinity if k is bigger than 1. And so all we're left with is two mi is the k equals 1 term, which is 2 minus q x minus 1 over 2. This is going to vanish if and only if x is 1 over 2 minus q. However, we were given that x is an integer which is not negative 1, and we are given that q is greater than or equal to 3. So this can't happen. So this limit is going to be non-zero. And so the, the ratio then is going to converge here to 1. So in this limit, this part converges to 1. So all we're left with is the binomial coefficients. And when you just work through the definitions, this is there should be an absolute value here. This is the absolute value of s0 plus n over n plus 1, which converges to 1. So by the ratio test, we get that the uh, ratio of s is 1 half. And so if s q of s x is going to converge absolutely. So using this result, we just uh, we go uh, we go in and go out. The main thing to note is that s uh, s q we're going to be summing over translates of f of f where n is greater than or equal to one. So let's suppose 
S, so we saw that with this functional equation, uh, this defines f q of s for s greater than sigma q minus 1. So let's pick, say, an s between, with real part between sigma q minus 2 and sigma q minus 1. When we plug that s into this formula, it's going to lie in the regime of, of here, the plus, uh, plus n is going to shift everything over by at least 1. So it's going to be defined, then we can define sq of sx on the uh, strip from uh, sigma q minus 2 to sigma q minus 1, which when we then plug into this equation tells us that fq can be extended to the strip sigma q minus 2 to sigma q minus 1, and then continuing in that way inductively, we get what we want. Yeah. In particular, what we then see is that uh, we're going to get uh, poles like this. So, and this is, so, for example, given any s0 at which this is defined for all n greater than or equal to 0, sq of sx is then defined at s0 minus 1, our functional equation then tells us that we can define fq at s equals s0 minus 1. So if we call this s1, we then have that fq of s1 plus n is defined for all n greater than or equal to 0, which means that sq is defined at s2 equals s1 minus 1, and so on and so forth. And we then get that there are going to be poles at the, these numbers s, n, k, which is sigma q minus n plus 2k pi i over uh, log 2, where here n is non-negative and k is non-zero. The reason why I'm excluding the uh, k equals zero is because the behavior of fq of sx on the uh, real axis is a bit more complicated due to the presence of the Riemann zeta function. So uh, in this functional equation, this contributes poles uh, um, on the sigma q minus n plus the plus or minus the 2k pi i over ln2, and here this contributes a pole at s equals 1. If it so happens that, um, if it so happens that, uh, SQ, uh, that sigma q is a positive integer, then there's, with, uh, the, uh, the poles that come from, uh, where was it, the poles that come from this thing, one of them is going to overlap with one with the Riemann zeta functions pole, and that means we will have a double pole at s equals one rather than a single pole. On the other hand, if uh, sigma q is not an integer, then the, they're not going to overlap at all, and we're going to have a simple pole there. Um, so now the other thing that we need to consider is there is this numerator term here. If this thing is zero, that could potentially cancel out the poles right here. So what we want to do is show that the, this quantity and this quantity can never both be zero at the same time. And that's the proposition here. Let q be an odd prime and let x be an odd integer. Then there are no values of n greater than or equal to zero or k and z such that uh, this number makes this equation zero. And by way of contradiction, suppose such an S and K exists. If we move things around and uh, evaluate complex logarithms, we then have that S must be of the form negative log base 2 of the absolute value of Q minus 1X plus 1 plus 2J pi I over ln 2 for some integer J. So this is the solution of this equation, and we know that S and K has this form. So... Uh, for this to occur, we have to have that j is equal to k, so that the imaginary parts are the same. And then now we just need to make the real part, the real parts the same. So equating them and remembering that sigma q is log base 2 of q plus 1 over 2, we rearrange everything and we then get that n plus 1 is equal to the log base 2 of q plus 1 times the absolute value of q minus 1 x plus 1. Since this is an integer, and since q and x are integers, and since n is non-negative, in order for this equality to hold, note that the only prime number which divides this integer has to be 2, because otherwise, if not, then the log base 2 wouldn't evaluate to an integer. So there must be some non-negative integers m1 and m2, such that this is a power of 2, 2 to the m, and this is a power of, of 2 in, uh, in uh, 2 to the m, 2 to m1, 2 to the m2, and also 
since the log base 2 of this thing is just going to be m1 plus m2, we need n1 plus m2 to be equal to n plus 1. If we add 2x to both sides of this middle equation, we get this. And so if we sub, uh, then subtract 1, we get this, this, this equality. And then we can use this equality to get that 2 to the m1x is equal to q plus 1 times x, which is equal to 2 to the m2 plus 2x minus 1. So, since q and x are odd, this is going to be even number times odd, so this is even. So this, both sides must be even. Note that this forces m1 to be greater than or equal to 1, otherwise this would be odd times odd, which is odd. So m1 has to be bigger than or equal to 1. <clears throat> so that means this is even. But note here, if m2 is bigger than 0, this is going to be even plus even uh, minus odd, which is going to be odd. So here m2 has to be 0. So since m2 is 0, this is going to be 1 plus 2x minus 1, which is just 2x. That then forces m1 to be 1. And so m1 is equal to 1, m2 is equal to 0. And plugging this into here, uh, we then get that q has to be equal to 1, which contradicts the fact that q was an odd prime. So s and k cannot solve the equation, and we don't need to worry about any of the poles canceling. Uh, boop. Uh, so putting everything together, it, this is a Blanc Mage, and I'm going to explain why this picture is here in a bit. It, it just it jumped ahead of where I wanted it to be. So putting everything together, we've then proved the following. Let Q be an odd prime, and let X be an odd integer. Then FQ of SX can be analytically continued to a meromorphic function on the complex numbers with a half lattice of poles at... Mm, this thing at these points. There is also a pole at s equals 1, which has degree 1 if none of the SNKs are equal to 1, and has degree 2 if one of if the SNKs, if one of them is equal to 1. Now, while all of this is very nice, unfortunately, it can be shown that FQ of SX grows hyper exponentially as the real part of S goes to negative infinity, which means we cannot evaluate the inverse Mellon transform in Perron's formula exactly using a Cauchy's theorem and letting the left edge of the contour go to negative infinity. Still, it may be worth using tricks in conjunction with residue calculus to maybe obtain asymptotics for the summatory function of this thing. Note that if we take the inverse Mellon transform of gamma of s, fq of sx, uh, since gamma of s decays hyper exponentially as long as the real part of, as long as the imaginary part of s is not zero, um, as, as the real part of S goes to negative infinity, we can then potentially get an exact or, or an asymptotic or even exact formula for the behavior of this thing. And that might be of interest. And, but as I said, what's particularly um, uh, interesting is the, to study the cases of those divergent, or sorry, not divergent, those degenerate uh, hydromaps, the ones that are neither contracting nor uh, uh, expanding like the ones that uh, Acteon H said, those might be amenable to these techniques. It might also be interesting to see how things happen when we work in the multidimensional case, because then there's more complex dyna dynamics to get. Now, the block modules. So, in episode 7 of the first season, uh, or for the Brit, for any Brits out there, for the first series of Monty Python's Flying Circus, uh, a mysterious force is turning the British people into Scotsmen. And spoiler alert, the culprit behind the Scotsmanization turns out to be a race of blancmanges from outer, outer space. A blancmange or blancmange is a dessert. It's gelatinous. It looks like this. <clears throat> and uh, so the reason why the alien blanc blancmanges decided to turn Brits into Scotsmen was so that they could win Wimbledon. A tennis uh, championship, because at least in 1969, when the, the show came out, Scots were known to be less than stellar tennis players. Now, uh, just in a delightful twist, just like in the Monty Python episode, blamanges also end up lurking behind the asymptotics of chi q and m q. Only it's the mathematical type of, of blamange, the blamange curve rather than the dessert after which it was named. Uh, this curve is also known as the Takagi function after its discoverer. And um, the, these are a family of fractal curves that you can obtain by repeated midpoint division of a line segment. Uh, in this, I'm going to be basing most of my exposition here off of uh, Jeffrey Ligarius's excellent article on the Blamange curve. And yes, it's that same Ligarius. Uh, amusingly enough, uh, a flagellet as Mellon transform papers also cover this, specifically in Mellon transforms and asymptotics 
digital sums, and I'll include the links in the description. So in general, uh, we tr when where w is a real parameter between negative one and one in, in endpoints excluded, the Takagi Landsberg function tw is the function on the unit interval defined by this thing. Here, s of x is the triangle wave function, which gives us the shortest distance between the input x and the set of integers. This is the classical uh, uh, Blamange curve, Takagi's curve, is when w equals one half, and we then get this thing. And note that the cross section, it looks kind of like a Blamange. It's also fractal. Um, uh, when w equals one fourth, the, this will curve will simplify to a parabola, and the fact that that's because you can obtain a parabola by midpoint subdivision, and this fact was first proved by Archimedes way, way back when. So, as it turns out, the Blamange curve is hidden within the summatory function of our number of ones function. This tells us, remember, this is the number of ones digits in the binary digits of m. Uh, this is wrong. This is the number of ones in the binary digits of m. And to, to see the connection here, uh, recall our, from our generating uh, function identity from episode one, this thing. If we logarithmic, you can also use the recursive method uh, to prove, uh, the, to find the, the summatory function formula, but you can also use this method, which is if we logarithmically differentiate the, the left-hand side here with respect to A, we end up getting this formula setting a equals z equals 1, then gives us k equals 1 to 2 to the n minus 1. This sum is equal to n times 2 to the n minus 1. Now, if we just formally replace log base n with log base 2 of n plus 1, this thing becomes n plus 1 over 2 times log base 2 of n plus 1. Uh, this asymptotic, so this, this suggests that the nth, uh, so the sum of from 1 to n of the number of 1's functions is this, or is at least asymptotic to this. You can prove this rigorously, but we won't do so here. Well, anyhow, what the idea is, now that we know the dominant, uh, asympto at dominant uh, asymptotic term of this summatory function, let's subtract it off. And so I define the Blanc uh, BL of x is the dominant asymptotic minus the uh, partial sum, and then the graph is this thing. And so what we then have is it's a it's fractal. We have copies of the Blum, of an increasingly accurate rendition of the Blamange curve, and they get uh, bigger and bigger here. And uh, this type of curve is called a batrachion, from uh, the Greek term uh, batrach, uh, which is the Greek automatopoeia for the sound that frogs make. And so this is it's like a leapfrog curve because it's, it's what you get when you graph a function which uh, which is from the non-negative integers to the real numbers, and you get these kinds of things. They're called batrachions. So here's our summatory blamage, and this is what happens when we subtract off the dominant growth term from the summatory function of our number of ones function. So uh, uh, now the uh, this uh, this result here, one way of, this was original, this connect connection between the uh, blamage curve and the number of ones the digit function was first discovered by Trollope in 1968, where he obtained a closed form expression, uh, exact, which exactly relates this summatory function with our uh, with the original Takagi function, and uh, Trollope's formula is that the sum from m equals one to n of the number of ones in m is n plus one times lambda of n plus one over two. Here, this is me being lazy. This should be lambda two. So here, lambda is the number of binary digits of n. It's lambda of n plus 1 minus 2 to the lambda n over 2 minus 2 lambda 2 minus 2 lambda to the lambda n minus 2 times Takagi function of thing. And uh, a f the flagellate article on digital uh, sums, it, prove, it proves this formula using uh, Perron's formula. And it, um, among the other things you can do is prove that... Um, where did I put it? Um, you can prove this identity. So it's, it's, this is one thing they also show in that paper, and it's a fun computation to do on your own. So we're going to our blamanges again. Uh, just so that's the thing we got. And so this is what Trollope shows. Now, the cool thing is because chi-q and mq depend on the number of ones, 
blancmanges will also appear in them. So using our computations for the summatory functions of chi q and m q, let's just do what we did before and replace big N with log base 2 of big N plus 1. This then gives the following asymptotic suggestions, which is that this summatory function should be asymptotic to uh, n plus 1 over 4, a uh, log 2 of n plus 1, and th when q is 3, and when q is greater than or equal to 5, it should be n plus 1 times n plus 1 to the sigma q minus 1 minus 1 over q minus 3. Here, this asymptotics, in all these cases, it's big O. <laughs> uh, now, here's something cool. If you take this and just, as we said previously, treat Q as just a parameter, you can get this case from this case by computing the limit. You can use L'Hopital's rule, differentiate with respect to Q when the numerator and the denominator, and you get the Q equals 3 case. So this, just to get back to the bigger, grander uh, ideas here, this is another one of those spooky things. As we'll see, the, treating Q as a parameter works not only in the Archimedean case, when we're doing real and complex analysis with chi Q, it also works in the non-Archimedean case. So again, I strongly suspect there should be some fancy schmancy category thing we can do to unify this and make it all make sense, but I would have no idea how to get even started with that. Anyhow, just like we defined with a, bl 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 a blamange, we got a blamange curve by subtracting the summatory function from our guess from the asymptotic, we also are going to do the same thing here. And so letting Q be a real number greater than 1, let's define the blamange, the BLQ, as this. It's Q over Q minus 1 at times the floor of x plus 1 to the power of sigma Q minus 1 minus the summatory function of MQ. And so here, likewise, because then for MQ, this is where we get to this asymptotic, what it's going to be. We get this. And so here are the graphs. This is the graph of BL3, the summatory blamange. So notice that it's tilted, but it's still the blamange fractal behavior is very clearly present. And this is a fun thing. Others, no, I'll get to that in a moment when I explain it. So... Um, while BLQ still retains the blancmange, also you can get similar curves when you if you do the corresponding thing by subtracting this from this, you will get things, but they're not as pretty. So um, while BLQ still retains blancmange structure for Q greater than or equal to five, the curve is much more diffusely spaced, and you have to go to logarithmic scaling on the y-axis in order for the behavior to become apparent. Uh, thus, the presence of the blancmange structure is not the unique purview of, not unique to the Q equals 3 case. However, there is a decisive uh, difference between uh, MQ for Q equals 3 and MQ for Q greater than or equal to 5, and this is the size of MQ of N relative to 1. So here, what we're going to do is let's consider BLQ twiddle. It's the summatory function of 1 minus MQ of N. As constructed, note that we have, we can go back, that this is going to satisfy this property, and so we have that MQ of X is going to be less than 1 if and only if BL Q twiddle is increasing. And uh, likewise, this is going to be greater than 1 if and only if BL Q twiddle is decreasing. So what this shows is the blue regions here are, this is the graph of a segment of BL3 twiddle. The blue is where M3 of X is greater than 1. And remember, that is the condition that we associate with positive integer periodic points. Yeah. Here, then, is uh, BL3 twiddle, BL5 twiddle, and BL7 twiddle, and we're taking absolute values, and this is logarithmic scaling. And so here, you can get a little bit of the, of the wiggle, but notice, this function is dipping down much more often than uh, this function is, and then these are. Uh, and so when we plot uh, BLQ twiddle, for, it says there's less wiggle. Um, in particular, we've seen this before, if we define XQ plus and XQ minus as the set of N, which make MQ less than 1 or greater than 1, respectively, it seems that for odd Q greater than or equal to 3, uh, the density of chi Q plus is going to be greater, well, the upper density is going to be greater than the upper density of chi Q minus, if and only if Q is equal to 3. And this corresponds to the uh, behavior that we conjectured of the logarithm of MQ of N, which is this thing uh, that we saw in earlier episodes.
So this is all quite nice. And uh, yeah. So and, and yes, the, the next episode is going to be called Shut Up and Compute. Um, yes, so that's our little sojourn through the uh, through the uh, bleh, th uh, through the Mellon transform methods. And it's really neat that we can do this. Uh, and again, it's worth exploring to see what can be done, in particular if we can use residues to try and get some useful asymptotics in certain cases. But what we note here is that because this just shows one way in which the correspondence principle allows us to, do, to bring new ideas and new approaches into studying these collapse-type problems. Uh, the fact that we can use Perron's formula and Mellon transform, it's already beginning to show that there's spectral theoretic stuff going on, and we're going to get a cl only clearer and clearer indications of that going forward. And so uh, that's it for uh, this, today's episode, and I'll see you back, guys, back uh, maybe next week. Maybe later, but I'll try and do it as quickly as possible. So, bye for now.